Good morning, Drew. I see you're enjoying that new iPhone. No, I'm not, Tim. It, it's fine, but it's not that different. It's uh, not quite what you were expecting, was it? No, all the leaks were right, and I got everything exactly the way I thought I would. <laughs> just admit it, Drew. You were wrong about a lot of our products. Wasn't wrong. There were just a couple little details I got hung up on, okay? Drew. You really like the iPhone 14, don't you? Okay, not necessarily, but fine. I'll cave and admit there were a lot of things we got wrong, and you surprised me a little bit, all right? <laughs> I think it's safe to say more than just a little bit. Fine, you won me over on this one, Tim. Let's begin. I wanted to recap sort of the five major things that I got wrong about the iPhone 14 Pro and the lineup as a whole. And it's not necessarily things that were just leaked. There were also a lot of concerns and things I had after the announcement that now that I've used the iPhone, I have a bit more experience and opinions with. But the first one, which is staring us all right in the face, that was the biggest surprise, is Dynamic Island. Yes, we called it the eye hole all year. And what's funny about that report is that it was like technically accurate. We got the execution wrong as to how Apple was going to handle the eye hole. But as far as like the hardware and the design, that was spot on. Technically, there are two cutouts and there are pixels between those cutouts. We were incorrect in our assumptions on how Apple would handle that via software. All of us just assumed it would be like the notch and Apple would just kind of pretend it's not there and just say that's the newer iPhone look, I guess. But what definitely surprised me was how well Apple integrated it into iOS. Now even showing the dynamic island in screen recordings, but of course, all of its dynamic features showcasing for phone calls, timers, now playing widgets that you can hold and expand on, and Face ID now, every time you activate it, comes out of that little island. All of these things no one was really calling or predicting, and that was by far, in my opinion, the biggest surprise, and I'm comfortable saying something I got wrong, you know? I used to describe it as a side grade at best, but I was not anticipating Apple would actually turn the notch into a feature to now where a lot of people are like, oh dang, my old iPhone doesn't have dynamic island. You gotta live with static peninsula. Second thing was something we actually got right in the leaks. If you recall way back, there were a few videos I did talking about how Apple was planning on ditching the physical SIM card in the iPhone 14 lineup, and I was pretty concerned about that, and I was pretty outspoken even after it was announced, and Apple confirmed that the US iPhones wouldn't be getting the SIM tray anymore. I expressed a lot of frustration surrounding that, and some of it is still justified because certain carriers are not good with eSIM and people overseas that are traveling are gonna have a hard time switching between carriers now but in my own personal experience now with eSIM I use Mint Mobile not a sponsor or anything I just chose their service because it was affordable and I like Ryan Reynolds but they have made the switch to eSIM insanely easy so I thought because I'd never done it before it was gonna be this big headache where I was gonna have to call someone and wait for hours and I had heard all of these horror stories from my friends about how frustrating eSIM can be but I was very happy to find out. You just download the Mint Mobile app, you tap a button that says like, this is my new phone, I want an eSIM on this phone, and within a matter of about two minutes, I had my phone number transferred over to the new iPhone. And I realized I didn't have to use a SIM tray removal tool, which was kind of handy, and it didn't take very long and I didn't have to reboot the phone or anything, it just started working. I just tapped a few buttons and all of a sudden the antenna bars start showing up on my phone, I'm getting phone calls, I'm getting texts. So I thought that was going to be a bigger issue than it really ended up being, and after finally converting my physical SIM into an eSIM, I now realize how simplified and how streamlined that process can be, and while I'm sure it's going to be annoying during this conversion process, especially because a lot of carriers are not as smart as Mint Mobile and have made the process of switching to eSIM more complicated, and my heart goes out to all of you, I am now starting to side a bit more on Apple's end where I'm thinking, you know, even though all carriers don't get eSIM right, I'm kind of glad now that Apple is going to start accelerating that transition because basically they sent out this message to all carriers that hey we sell the best selling phones in the world and we're moving away from the physical sims so you better get your acts together and I do think similar to Apple ditching the headphone jack or ditching USB-A or Firewire or the CD drives like we're all going to be annoyed by it at first but I think in the long run it will ultimately be a good thing it will get carriers on board with making eSIM a bit more 
of a simplified, easy to activate process. Even if it's not that today, it's ultimately something I'm in favor of now after trying it. It feels so simple and so minimal to just be like, this is my new phone, put the SIM in here, and then the phone just has your new phone number. So I've changed my position a little bit on that, and I know it's going to be annoying for many of you, but I do think in the long run, it will help the design of the iPhone get more streamlined, get better battery life or better water resistance, and ultimately make SIMs a lot safer too. It feels a bit dated that it's 2022 and a lot of us still want to deal with these physical cards to let you know which phone has which number. Like, come on, the future has arrived. It should just know it's your new phone, and I think we'll all benefit from it in the long run. Third thing I got wrong is more of a tech spec thing, but I was really expecting because the camera bumps were getting bigger and the chassis was rumored to get a lot larger that the weight would be substantially higher. And I was pleasantly surprised to find out the iPhone 14 Pro Max is almost the exact same weight as the 13 Pro Max, which was already kind of cumbersome to hold in my opinion, and it is nearing that uncomfortable size for many people, but I thought that the weight was going to be much worse or more noticeable than it ended up being. It's basically identical to the 13 Pro Max. There's only a difference of like 0.01 ounces, which you're not going to notice. That weight might even change if it's just raining out and your phone picks up a few more water droplets. That's how small of a difference we're talking about here, but yeah, I was wrong on that. I thought the 14s were going to be a lot more chonk than they ended up being. Number four is one I was kind of pleasantly surprised by all year because there had been this rumor about Apple adopting a 48 megapixel camera that made everyone assume Apple must be making the jump to 8K video, right? Because other Androids have had 8K video recording. And I was expecting Apple was going to follow suit and just keep chasing those numbers and say, yeah, okay, now you can record an 8K on an iPhone and that means it's much better than the last iPhone, which again, I've been fairly outspoken about 8K and how pointless it is and how chasing resolutions for the sake of higher megapixel counts is pointless. It takes up too much space and it doesn't ultimately make the video or image even look that much better. It just makes it a little bit more interesting to pixel peep on. But Apple didn't go that route, which honestly surprised me. I thought they were going to use 8K as a great selling point of why the 13 Pro camera isn't as good as the 14 Pro. And I'm sure they still have that. You know, they can brag about action mode and they can brag about Pro Raw being 48 megapixel on the new 14 and stuff. But I was pleasantly surprised that in the video resolution department, Apple has still kept it to 4K at 60. On the flip side, though, I was also expecting cinematic mode to support 4K at 60 or ProRes to get an update there. I thought maybe they would bring 4K ProRes to the 128 gig iPhone and they still didn't do that. In fact, since the iPhone 14s are using this upgraded main sensor that came from the 13 Pro and they're even using the exact same A15 chip that the 13 Pros used, I was kind of expecting ProRes recording to come to the regular iPhone 14s and it didn't. And I personally believe there's no issue with the hardware. I don't think there's anything wrong with the iPhone 14s hardware that prevents it from recording ProRes. I believe that is purely just Apple software locking out features, which they're not above doing that. And sometimes they change their mind down the road. So maybe iOS 17 will bring ProRes recording to the iPhone 14s or could bring action mode to the 13 Pros and stuff. But I was anticipating at least an 8K video option, which I thought was going to be pointless. And I was going to have to argue as to why I don't think we need that on a phone, especially with how limited screens are with how they can output at 8K. But no, Apple didn't take the bait on that one. They could have gone the marketing route and just bragged about higher resolutions, but I feel like they wisely chose otherwise and just decided to say, no, you know, one of the main advantages of a 48 megapixel sensor is we can get back a full resolution 2X without having to have a dedicated lens. I thought that was more efficient, more clever. It does kind of make the 3X telephoto feel kind of unnecessary, but I'm proud that Apple didn't take the 8K bait like all these other Android phones do, even if the feature is not that well thought out. And lastly, number five is also a bit of a technicality. It's specific to my region, but the price. If you were watching our podcasts and videos leading up to the iPhone 14 launch, I was so convinced that the pros at least were going to be getting a pretty massive price hike. And leading up to the launch, I actually thought the regular 14s would get a price hike as well. But I was incredibly shocked to find out that at least in the United States, the iPhone 14s did not get any price hikes across the board, which blew my mind because even the iPhone SE got a price hike. And with the inflation we're facing right now, I know that the dollar does not carry the same value that it used to a year ago. But the fact that Apple has basically kept prices around the same for four years, for four generations of iPhone, okay, let alone inflation that's happened in the last two years. But over the course of four years, you know, Apple first introduced the Mac size with the 10s. That was $1,100 and it was 
thousand for the regular 10s and that was back in 2018 and here we are in 2022 all of these changes have been made apple's made all of these upgrades to the displays the cameras the chassis and the battery lives have improved so much over the past four years and i'm impressed that after all this time even with storage improvements and ram improvements and all that they have kept the prices the same the 10s max had the same launch price as the 14 pro max which i think the 14 pro max is like a way better phone and they could totally justify charging way more for that phone if they wanted to considering how much better the battery life is how much better the camera is how much better the display is and yet they've kept prices the same after all this time which a lot of people probably won't notice or appreciate because we just think oh yeah new iphone's expensive but i know that's not technically true overseas because there were quite a lot of price hikes in other regions outside of the united states so i'm sorry to those people i guess you could say my price predictions and my speculation on the price hikes were accurate outside of the u.s because in the last couple podcasts i was actually predicting that the price hikes were not just going to be a hundred dollars more i thought that the pro max would be a hundred and fifty dollars more and i was feeling more and more confident about that as we got closer to the launch but that's actually pretty close to the price hikes a lot of people saw overseas so in a way my prediction was accurate but in the u.s i was very pleasantly surprised with the pricing i thought they were pretty reasonable for the upgrades offered at least in particular with the pro lineup with the regular iphone 14s yeah i'm still very much of the belief everyone should just go for an iphone 13 at that point and if you already have an iphone 13 then yeah you don't need to upgrade but let me know if there's other things you thought i was blatantly wrong on with the iphone 14 line in the comments below anything that pleasantly surprised you or unpleasantly surprised you with the lineup all that good stuff let me know what you're thinking down below this is your apple sheep here and i'll see you all in the next one